When you think about racial equality and civil rights, which political party comes to mind? The Republicans or the Democrats? Most people would probably say the Democrats, but this answer is incorrect. Since its founding in 1829, the Democratic Party has fought against every major civil rights initiative and has a long history of discrimination. The Democratic Party defended slavery, started the Civil War, opposed Reconstruction, founded the Ku Klux Klan, imposed segregation, perpetrated lynchings, and fought against the Civil Rights Acts of the 1950s and 1960s. In contrast, the Republican Party was founded in 1854 as an anti-slavery party. Its mission was to stop the spread of slavery into the new Western territories with the aim of abolishing it entirely. This effort, however, was dealt a major blow by the Supreme Court in the 1857 case Dred Scott versus Sandford. The court ruled that slaves aren't citizens, they're property. The seven justices who voted in favor of slavery, all Democrats. The two justices who dissented, both Republicans. The slavery question was, of course, ultimately resolved by a bloody civil war. The commander in chief during that war was the first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln the man who freed the slaves. Six days after the Confederate Army surrendered, John Wilkes Booth, a Democrat, assassinated President Lincoln. Lincoln's vice president, a Democrat named Andrew Johnson, assumed the presidency. But Johnson adamantly opposed Lincoln's plan to integrate the newly freed slaves into the South's economic and social order. Johnson and the Democratic Party were unified in their opposition to the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, the 14th Amendment, which gave blacks citizenship, and the 15th Amendment, which gave blacks the vote. All three passed only because of universal Republican support. During the era of Reconstruction, federal troops stationed in the South helped secure rights for the newly freed slaves. Hundreds of black men were elected to southern state legislatures as Republicans, and 22 black Republicans served in the U.S. Congress by 1900. The Democrats did not elect a black man to Congress until 1935. But after Reconstruction ended, when the federal troops went home, Democrats roared back into power in the South. They quickly reestablished white supremacy across the region, with measures like black codes, laws that restricted the ability of blacks to own property and run businesses, and they imposed poll taxes and literacy tests used to subvert black citizens' right to vote. And how was all of this enforced? By terror, much of it instigated by the Ku Klux Klan, founded by a Democrat, Nathan Bedford Forrest. As historian Eric Foner, himself a Democrat, notes, in effect, the Klan was a military force serving the interests of the Democratic Party. President Woodrow Wilson, a Democrat, shared many views with the Klan. He resegregated many federal agencies and even screened the first movie ever played at the White House, the racist film, The Birth of a Nation, originally entitled The Klansman. A few decades later, the only serious congressional opposition to the landmark Civil Rights Act of 1964 came from Democrats. 80% of Republicans in Congress supported the bill, less than 70% of Democrats did. Democratic senators filibustered the bill for 75 days until Republicans mustered the few extra votes needed to break the log jam. And when all of their efforts to enslave blacks keep them enslaved, and then keep them from voting had failed, the Democrats came up with a new strategy. If black people are going to vote, they might as well vote for Democrats, as President Lyndon Johnson was purported to have said about the Civil Rights Act, I'll have them as voting Democrat for 200 years. So now, the Democratic Party prospers on the votes of the very people it has spent much of its history oppressing.
Democrats falsely claim that the Republican Party is the villain, when in reality, it's the failed policies of the Democratic Party that have kept blacks down. Massive government welfare has decimated the black family. Opposition to school choice has kept them trapped in failing schools. Politically correct policing has left black neighborhoods defenseless against violent crime. So when you think about racial equality and civil rights, which political party should come to mind? I'm Carol Swain, professor of political science and law at Vanderbilt University for Prager University. Well, Reagan, what you just repeated here today is patent. Wait, no, no Hillary, Trump, you just spoke. I did not, spoke, I did not say anything about Ronald Reagan. You said two you just, things. You, you talked spoke. about admiring Hillary, Ronald Reagan, sorry, and you, you talked about you, the you ideas of the Senator Republicans. Senator I didn't talk about Hillary, Ronald Reagan. Hillary, we just have the tape. You just said that I complimented the Republican ideas. That is not true. What I said, and I will provide you with a quote. What I said was, is that Ronald Reagan was a transformative political figure because he was able to get Democrats to vote against their economic interests, to form a majority, to push through their agenda, an agenda that I objected to, because while I was working on those streets, watching those folks see their jobs shipped overseas, you were a corporate lawyer sitting on the board of Walmart. I was fighting these fights. I was fighting these fights. So, but I want to be clear. So, so I, so I want to be clear. What I said had nothing to do with their policies. I spent a lifetime fighting against Ronald Reagan's policies. But what I did say, is that we have to be thinking in the same transformative way about our democratic agenda. We've got to appeal to independents and Republicans in order to build a working majority to move an agenda forward. That is what I said. Now, you can dispute that, but let me, let me finish. Hillary, you went on for two minutes. Let me finish. The irony of this is that you provided much more fulsome praise of Ronald Reagan in a book by Tom Brokaw that's being published right now. As did, Bill, as did Bill Clinton in the past. So these are the kinds of political games that we are accustomed to. I'm sorry. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let that wrap up and then I'm going to come to you. I just want to clarify. I want to clarify the record. Wait a minute. Wait a second. Senator Edwards, hold on. A specific... There has been a specific charge leveled against Hillary Clinton, yes. so she can respond, then I'll bring I, in Senator I just want to be sure. We, we got a long time to go. You'll have a good opportunity. Thanks. We're just getting warmed up. Now, I just, I just want to be clear about this. In an editorial board with the Reno newspaper, you said two different things because I have read the transcript. Mm -hmm. You talked about Ronald Reagan being a transformative political leader. I did not mention his name. Your you, did. Well, I'm here. He's okay, not. Okay, well, and I can't tell who I'm running against sometimes. Know, well, you know, I, I think we both have very passionate and committed spouses who stand up for us, and I'm proud of that. Uh, but you also talked about the Republicans having ideas over the last 10 to 15 I years. I they were good ones. Well, you can read the context of it. Well, it certainly I didn't came say across. They were good ones. To, well, it certainly right, well, well, it certainly yeah. came across in the way that it was presented as though the Republicans had been standing up against the conventional wisdom with their ideas. I'm just reacting to the fact, yes, they did have ideas and they were bad ideas, yeah, bad for America, and I was fighting against those ideas when you were practicing law and representing your contributor, Resco, in his slum landlord business in inner city Chicago. Hold on one second, hold on. Senator, Senator, Edwards, Senator Edwards has been remarkably patient during this exchange. And I want him, I don't know if you want to get involved in this, Senator Edwards. Care about our legacy. Realize everything we stand for is at stake. All the...
missing mess incarceration. That's on the ballot right now. And there is one candidate who will advance those, those things. And there is another candidate whose defining principle, the central theme of his candidacy, is opposition to all that we've done. No such thing as a vote that doesn't matter. It all matters. And after we have achieved historic turnout in 2008 and 2012, especially in the African American community, I will consider it a personal insult, an insult to my legacy if this community lets down its guard and fails to activate itself in this election. You want to give me a good send off? Go vote. And I'm going to be working as hard as I can these next seven weeks to make sure folks do. House today voting in favor of an amendment to prevent President Trump from taking military action in Iran. The amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act would block funding U.S. military action against Iran unless Congress has declared war or enacted specific authorization. Joining me now is former Army Intel and Special Operations Soldier Brett Velikovich. So, Brett, I want to look at the bigger foreign policy picture, if you don't mind, particularly since Joe Biden was just touting his foreign policy record this week. Iran is just one of the messes President Trump is trying to clean up from the previous administration. I just want to go through, we mentioned Iran. Let's, let's go to ISIS next because this was a horrific terrorist organization that President Obama called a JV team, essentially let them alone so they could build, build up their, their horrible forces and particularly their presence in Syria. It was Trump who had to come in and wipe them off the map. Exactly. And Biden could barely even pronounce ISIS. I mean, he's taking credit for something that essentially uh, Trump uh, saw through the finish line. I mean, you know, the Obama administration, they didn't they they wanted to conduct action against ISIS and, and root them out. But the problem was that they pulled us out of Iraq too soon. And I was there. I remember that time when we sat there and we saw what ISIS could be, become. We still saw them basically hiding out because, one, the Obama administration signaled that we were going to leave. And so essentially right. when the U.S. troops left, they, they were able to take over. And I think that was that was one of the major problems. And so the Trump administration has actually, you know, got it done and got the, the, the caliphate wiped off the face of the earth. There's still remnants of ISIS, but they're nowhere near the strength they used to be. And then there's the place that ISIS used to hang out, which is Syria. Uh, we remember President Obama painting that red line. Well, let's let's play the tape and, and get your reaction. We have communicated in no uncertain terms with every player in the region that that's a red line for us and that there would be enormous consequences if we start seeing movement on the chemical weapons front uh, or the use of chemical weapons. So Syria walked right over that red line and there were no consequences, whereas a very similar thing happened shortly after Trump came in office and then came the tomahawks. Precisely, and that's that's the thing here is that we basically, when Obama sat there and said that we were going to do something if they released chemical weapons and we didn't, we look foolish, we look weak. And so we've got this mess because we allowed these organizations, these groups to mass We allowed the Syrians, we allowed Russia to come in there, the Iranians to come into Syria and prop up the Syrian regime. And now we've got another mess still there to fix. Syria is an absolute mess. And it's a perfect example of why we need to, to show strength when it comes to the Middle East. And then, of course, the biggest country in the world population wise, China. For decades, China was getting away with murder, not, not only in terms of their economic policy, which the president is trying to turn around through his his uh, new trade deal with them, but but militarily moving in on places where they shouldn't have been, this administration is trying to turn it around. The last administration did next to nothing against them. Right. Well, the Chinese have been economically at war with us for years. I mean, look, from a cyber standpoint, from an intelligence perspective, they've been stealing our intellectual property. That is absolutely war. But they're they're a lot more sneaky about it. And, you know, they're building up their military capability. They're building up their artificial intelligence. They have AI farms that are out there that are basically, you know, they believe the Chinese government that whoever controls AI controls the world. And so we're finally doing something about that, which for decades we've simply left unchecked because uh, the administration before didn't right. want to do anything about it. So Trump is actually trying to do something here. And finally, Russia, the, the country that, that was supposed to be motivating uh, President Trump to do anything they wanted to do. In fact, 
We remember the time when President Obama tapped uh, their president on the knee and said, tell Vlad that once I'm reelected, everything will be okay. They waltzed, shortly after that, they waltzed right into the Crimea, took it over. Uh, we did absolutely nothing. And this president comes in and he actually takes them on in places like Syria, uh, where we wiped out a lot of Russian mercenaries. Right, exactly. And, and Russia is, is, it was more and more emboldened, especially when uh, President Obama leaned over and told the previous Rus uh, Russian president that he'd have more ability to, to work with them during the second term. And that, of course, made them think that they could get away with a lot of this, uh, you know, working to disrupt our political campaigns and our election cycle. And uh, they be become more and more emboldened around the world. And we, we basically left them unchecked. They're sitting there in Venezuela. They're in Syria. They're, they want to break the these alliances that we have with the, a lot of these different countries and so finally we're, we're, we're looking at doing something here about it yeah we're finally getting some work done Brett good to see you thank you very much appreciate it go down as being one of the worst presidents ever today if you look at the time that we were brought here as slave 400 years ago we got the same results today we look like we live in Beirut somewhere ambulance by the police running up and down the street all the violence our community oh my children have the same love for these young people like you got for the ones across the border and you want to save them. President Barack needs to pay attention to Chicago. If he cannot pay attention to Chicago and the African American community, he needs to resign. Here we got a mayor in our city and our president of the United States who have passed legislation and have given up funding to create opportunities for new citizens to come into your people who have been born and raised here. With the president uh, setting aside all of these funds for immigrants and forsaken African-American community and African-American uh, family, I think that's a disgrace. And Barack is from the heart of 55th uh, in the city of Chicago. He saw this as a state senator and he did not pay attention then. Mr. President, we're asking for you. You're spending billions of dollars in Texas, but we got a problem here in Chicago. We will not stand by this here and keep letting this senseless killing and shooting happening in our community. Uh, again, what do you have to lose by trying something new like Trump? What do you have to lose? Islamic terrorists, the way it's heard, the way it's received by our friends and allies around the world is that somehow Islam is terroristic. And that then makes them feel as if they're under attack. In some cases, it makes it harder for us to get their cooperation in fighting terrorism. So do I think that if somebody uses the phrase Islamic terrorism, that it's a huge deal? No. There is no doubt that these folks think that and claim that they're speaking for Islam. But I don't want to validate what they do. I don't want to. If you had a an organization that was going around killing and blowing people up and said, we're on the <coughs> vanguard of Christianity. Well, I'm not. As a Christian, I'm not going to let them claim my religion and say you're killing for Christ. I would, I would say that's ridiculous. That's not what my religion stands for. Call these folks what they are, which is killers and terrorists. And, and that's what we've been trying to do, is to make sure that, A, we don't validate their claims that somehow they speak for Islam because they don't, and B, making sure that we do not uh, make... Muslims who are well-meaning and are natural allies on this fight because these groups are killing more Muslims than they're killing anybody else Make sure that they don't feel as if somehow th this is some contest between the West and Islam We must fix an economy in America that is rigged and that sends almost all of the new wealth 
and income to the top 1%. We must raise the minimum wage to a living wage. This campaign is about moving the United States toward universal health care, tripling funding for the National Health Service Corps. All right. Our next guest was a Bernie Sanders supporter. Carolyn Heldman is with us. Uh, Carolyn, welcome back to the program. It's good to see you again. Good to see you, you there. Too. Okay, okay. Okay, now, uh, you won. I think you flat out won. I think Bernie Sanders has dragged the Democrats all the way to becoming a socialist party. Are you happy? Well, I would disagree with you. I don't think we've won at all. I mean, we, we made some slight gains, right? Hillary Clinton started talking about Wall Street reform, started talking about more affordable education, single payer for health care. But other than that, um, there hasn't been a radical shift to the left. Um, really? Hillary Clinton really? is a moderate Democrat. Whoa, 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 wait a second. There has not been a shift to the left. Free college, uh, uh, universal health care, a huge increase in the minimum wage, and more crackdown on Wall Street, tax the rich till the pips squeak. I don't think that's a minor shift to the left. I think there's a huge road right to the socialist left. Come on, where you been? You know, Bernie Sanders isn't even a socialist. He's just a New Deal Democrat. So the idea that somehow Hillary Clinton has become a socialist, I think, is laughable. Um, it, these, the, the uh, party platform that you're referring to are the pieces of the party platform. Many of those pieces have been, have been in place for decades. So this is nothing new. The question is, what will Hillary Clinton prioritize? She's certainly not a democratic socialist. She's way to the right uh, than Bernie supporters like myself. And it would be really nice if, if okay. we had one. Right. Um, right. But at the end of the day, we haven't. Okay. I, th this is just a financial program. We deal heavily in economics. And um, I just want you to tell us in very clear terms how you get growth in the American economy if you have a vast increase in the taxation uh, of, of our country. How do you get growth? Spell it out for me. Well, Certainly. Um, if you look at the track record from 1945 on, you can see that the Democrats actually have an excellent track record. Republicans have, uh, like, like Ronald Reagan, right, have tripled the deficit. Um, they have been the primary driver behind the growth in, def and de in debt and deficit. And so if you look at, at paying for these particular plans, you restore the income tax growth. rate on the wealthiest Americans. I, I, I asked I, you about growth, okay? Now, you tell me. That's How connected do we get to the debt deficit? Growth. You're telling By me that growth isn't connected to is the debt. The economy is down to 1% growth at this moment. You propose to come into power and have an impose a massive increase in taxation. Tell me how a huge increase in taxation results in economic growth. Tell me. Well, it results because you actually tax the people who can afford to pay for it so that other people can get things like education and training that, that produce growth. So you restore the income tax rates. Where you restore has this the, ever worked? Uh, death tax can you rate. show me an, eco an economy which uh, does yes. what you uh, have said yes, it should the 90s, do and where the you 90s, get real Bill growth? Clinton. The 90s and Bill Clinton. If you look actually at Obama's economy, he has also not only pulled us out of a catastrophic um, liquidity crisis, um, we also have remarkable growth given what he what he, he inherited. He didn't pull us out of so a remarkable you look liquidity at the crisis. All right, I, I can see we're failing on this one. Let me oh, ask you about did. morality. Oh, he certainly did. Let me, uh, no, he didn't. It was the Federal Reserve which pulled us out of the liquidity crisis, not President Obama. You, Let's get the facts you, straight. Who do you think now, listen to this. Runs what, morality. The, who do you I think always, runs I the national government? I always want to go back to the question the of morality. At this moment, at this very moment in time, if you live in certain parts of the country and make decent money, and by that I mean the eastern seaboard in California, you make decent money, you're already paying over half of your income in taxes, either the city, state, or federal government. Over half. I say that's immoral. I say it's flat out immoral for anybody to do that to you. And you obviously think it's just well fine. My response is twofold. First off, I think that income inequality is immoral. I think the fact that, that most of the wealth in our country is inherited, that we don't have a meritorious system that works for everyone, I think no, that not. is immoral. You I think that people who work 40 hours a week and can't pay their bills, that's immoral. So if you want to talk about morality, let's talk about the distribution of wealth in our country so that you is not meritorious. The real question, it benefits which I the top asked, 1%. And I've asked this so many times of you, but you will never address it. I think it is flat out immoral 
for a government to take more than half of someone's income. And that's what they're doing now. That's and not what's you happening. Want more. You're, you're misrepresenting the case. You are wrong. misrepresenting the case, Stu. No, no. You are misrepresenting the case. No, uh, wealthiest no. Americans are laughing at what you're saying right now because we all know how tax havens work. We don't pay 50% of our wealth in taxes. Give me a break. No, tax we don't. Tax hey, um, see, all sorts of investment breaks. I mean, come on. Are, are you a professor of economics? Well, you've just confused Political two things. Political science, actually. I have a business degree. I worked in the private sector. You, you want to know my resume? We do not tax wealth in this country. We tax income. I don't think you know what you're doing to the strivers of this world. It's the strivers who make income. Is that your best response? When I call you on the fact, when I call you on the fact that the wealthiest Americans do not pay 50% of their wealth, your best response is to quibble about the terms that I use? Of course Why don't I you am. address that issue? They do, no, of why don't you address the issue? Oh, why don't you admit that the wealthiest Americans do not I pay really 50%? This is a waste Why don't of time? you admit that the wealthiest Americans do not pay 50% of their wait, wealth do you taxes? Want to take, admit it. Do you want to take wealth? Do you want, if, if I'm a wealthy guy, supposing I've got a billion dollars, okay? And it's in the stock market, it's in the real estate market. Do you want to come and take half of it? Just seize it? Is that what you want to do? Um, yeah. Uh, basically, ah. if you're making money off of Spoken money, I would like that to there, go, there go and uh, be redistributed immoral. to it is other Americans. And it is no, it's immoral, immoral yes, to make money off of totally money that, that you don't do anything for simply because you were born into wealth. That's what's immoral. <laughs> Man, what's immoral socialist. is our system of economy what? that doesn't actually help most Americans. That's immoral. Nonsense. Um, but, Callan, we completely disagree. Uh, yes, I hope we do. you never. We agree get into on that. Power. We I agree hope on you that. Never ever get a finger on the lever of power. That's all I hope. But I have it was no done. interest in your power or your wealth. No interest in that whatsoever. I know it's difficult to then believe, to take but there are a lot of Americans who are not it. interested in amassing wealth just to amass wealth. You want to take it. You want to take it. I want people and you're from a to be able family. to work and live. Have you asked your mom and dad about I this? Want people Seizing your parents' wealth? Have you asked them about this? Are they in favor of it? You My admitted on this program a couple of months ago. You come from a very wealthy family. Have you asked your mom and dad yes. about seizing half of their wealth? Have you? Well, my father passed away, so I can't okay, I'm ask very him sorry. that. But I did my, not know my that. Family, I'm no, very no, 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 that's that. fine. I apologize. No, no, Stu, my, my family wealth, uh, my family does redistribute their wealth, as do I. I. I give a lot of it away because I am not interested in a world in which people who are working full-time cannot pay for basic necessities. Okay, I want a different I world. And I believe other. that we can get to a better time, system Callan, of taxation. We have, to, you know, we have to pay bills on this program, so we've got a commercial coming up. <laughs> Thanks. To equate of democratic socialism, to equate what goes on in Venezuela with what I believe is extremely unfair. I'll tell you what I believe in terms of democratic socialism, guaranteeing health care to all people as a human right. In terms of democratic socialism, to equate what goes on in Venezuela with what I believe is extremely unfair. I'll tell you what I believe in terms of democratic socialism, guaranteeing health care to all people as a human right. In terms of democratic socialism, to equate what goes on in Venezuela with what I believe is extremely unfair. I'll tell you what I believe in terms of democratic socialism, guaranteeing health care to all people as a human right. In terms of democratic socialism, to equate what goes on in Venezuela with what I believe is extremely unfair. I'll tell you what I believe in terms of democratic socialism, guaranteeing health care to all people as a human right. Estoy seguro que de esto sí sabe. Varios gobiernos de izquierda, sobre todo los populistas, están en graves problemas en América Latina. El modelo socialista en Venezuela tiene al país cerca del colapso. Argentina, también Brasil. ¿Cómo explica eso? Usted me está haciendo unas preguntas. Pero eso sí le interesa. Estoy muy interesado, pero ahora estoy presentándome para presidente de Estados Unidos. Entonces no tiene opinión sobre la crisis en Venezuela. Claro que tengo una opinión, pero como le dije, ahora estoy enfocando en mi campaña. Out that shows that Bernie Sanders, the socialist, he wants $15 minimum wage for everyone, pay everybody as much money as we can. He is not paying his own campaign staffers very much. He's paying them less than he wants the minimum wage to be. What a hypocrite. Now, look, when I saw the report that he's not paying his staffers much, I think that's not a big deal. First of all, campaign work is often very basic work. It's not, it's not worth $15 an hour if you're just passing out pamphlets or putting up yard signs or something. It's actually not, it's 
very basic work that virtually anyone can do if they're motivated to do it. A lot of people on campaigns volunteer because they actually care about it, right? Campaigns are not motivated by making a profit, or they shouldn't be at least. They're supposed to be nonprofit organizations. They're supposed to be motivated by activism rather than money. The campaigns don't have much money to begin with. They want to use it carefully. They want to use it mostly on media buys. My first campaign that I ever worked on, I made on average 75 cents per hour. And that was about right. That's what they should have paid because campaigns have to run lean. The trouble is the hypocrisy. The trouble is Bernie is running on a $15 minimum wage and he won't extend that courtesy to his own employees. So last Thursday night, his staff leaks this story to the press that they've unionized and they're fighting for the $15 minimum wage and Bernie, the fake union champion, is fighting them on it. He's trying to crush their union. So after this leaks to the press, gets even better because the Bernie campaign responds and says, it is disrespectful to the bargaining unit to put so much work into this process that someone would take their concerns and go to the press. Whatever happened to democracy dies in darkness? Whatever happened to transparency? Get it all out there. Very different when it affects a left-wing campaign. Now, that's not even the best part of the story, that Bernie doesn't practice what he preached, that like all socialists, that he's a total hypocrite. The best part of the story is, now that this has come to the press's attention and the public's attention, Bernie has to give them $15 if he's not going to look like a total fraud. But there's only so much money. So how is he going to do this? He's promised he'll pay his workers $15 an hour and cut their hours. He's doing, he's showing you what happens under socialism. He's showing you what happens when you raise the minimum wage. There's only one true minimum wage. It's $0 an hour. You're not entitled to a job at a company or on a campaign. Just saying, okay, we'll give you $15 an hour, but we're not, that's not magically going to make more money appear. So we're just going to have to cut your hours. Big win for labor, right? No, it's actually a big loss for labor because they're losing. He's not paying them any more money. He's just taking away their opportunities to work. And by the way, the purpose of working on a campaign is not to make money. There are a lot easier ways to make money. It's to get experience. It's to network. It's to push forward your ideas. He says, quote, I'm very proud to be the first presidential candidate to recognize a union and negotiate a union contract. Well, it turns out Bernie's learning about socialism for the first time, right? He's always, he talks about socialism his whole life. The reason he's never learned about socialism is because he has always failed to implement his ideas. He's been in, in the government for about 50 years. He's never implemented any of his ideas, right? He's just, he's transformed ideologically the Democratic Party. It's now ideologically his party. But he's never actually affected any of his ideas, so he's never, he's never dealt with the consequences of them. Now he's learning in real time that his ideas don't work. Money doesn't just come from the sky, that you, you can't just raise the minimum wage without any consequence, and that actually raising the so-called minimum wage all, often, if not always, hurts the people that it's intended. Now Bernie Sanders has endorsed Ilhan Omar's re-election bid uh, he's endorsed her in a Democrat primary just a day or two after Nancy Pelosi endorsed her, too. Now, why does this matter? She's running against three other Democrats, maybe even four, if you count one, other, one of these other knuckleheads, uh, in the primary there. And one of them uh, is specifically opposing her because of her constant hatred toward Jews. She's obsessed with it in the statements that she's made. And yet Bernie Sanders, let, let's be honest about it, Bernie Sanders says, I'm a Jew and I worked in a kibbutz. Bernie Sanders worked in a communist kibbutz for one summer, basically. And Bernie Sanders is what he is. Religion is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Marxists put Marxism first. Marxism rejects religion. So if you're born a Jew or if you're born an African American, if you're born whatever you're born, that's all well and good. But you're a Marxist first and party comes first. The movement comes first. That's what he is. People want to soft pedal it a little bit. I don't soft pedal it. And so, uh, and, and by the way, you see the cross pollinization that goes on between the Democrats and Black Lives Matter, whose founders are out of the closet Marxists. Same with Antifa. And you see how they, uh, they, they, they kind of work together, don't they? I mean, you don't know of any Democrat who's worried about Antifa or Black Lives Matter who's elected, do you? They don't have to worry about their safety. They don't have to worry about their homes and so forth. Um, uh, Nancy Pelosi doesn't. Chuck Schumer doesn't. These people are going to vote Democrat, the vast majority of them. 
So anyway, he endorses Ilhan Omar. Nancy Pelosi has endorsed Ilhan Omar. And have you noticed all the press screaming about it? Not a word. So Marxism is being mainstreamed, anti-Semitism is being mainstreamed, anti-Americanism is being mainstreamed, Bernie Sanders is being mainstreamed. If we had a real media in this country, it would be Biden who's 15 points behind, because they would be exposing the fact that he's cognitively incapable of doing this job, and they'd be exposing the fact that he is surrounded by and ingratiated with this, this radical movement, but we don't have a real press, so there's no, no purpose in hoping. Now, speaking of anti-Semitism, you can see it growing. And by the way, where you find anti-Americanism, you find anti-Semitism. It's that simple. You just do. Um, and uh, because of the overlap, a Judeo-Christian nation, uh, the belief in certain principles, these principles we have as a country born out of the, the Enlightenment, born out of, as I say, Judeo-Christian principles, that's where they come from. And so if you hate America, you're going to hate Jews. And you're going to hate Christians, too. Christians of real faith, evangelical Christians and other Christians and Catholics who are true believers. I'm not talking about people who wear it but really don't practice. Believe it or not, this is Joe Biden's third attempt to run for president. History is lost when you live in the eternal present as we are now. But it's worth remembering some facts three times. The first time Biden ran was in 1988. That was before most of the people who work on the show were born. And he was caught lying about his biography in speeches and forced to drop out. Biden suggested to audiences that he had grown up in a coal mining family in Wales. That's not true. Joe Biden is actually from America. His father sold cars in Wilmington. Biden went to Catholic prep school in the suburbs. So it was pretty embarrassing. It took 20 years before Biden ran again, and when he did, it did not go well. In 2008, Joe Biden got a total of 1% of the vote in the Iowa caucuses, and he dropped out that night. Joe Biden, whatever his strengths, turns out to be so bad at running for president that even Barack Obama, supposedly his close friend, repeatedly refused to endorse him. He just can't win. That was Barack Obama's view. Then the Wuhan coronavirus arrived. Democratic governors shut down the country. Millions lost their jobs. The economy tanked. Americans huddled in their homes, cut off from one another, and deeply miserable. From his basement, strategically cloistered away in silence, Joe Biden shot ahead in the polls. Not because of anything he did, he just happened to be there. As of tonight, Joe Biden could win the race. Unfortunately, if he does, Joe Biden cannot govern the country. He isn't capable of it. He's all but admitted that. He said he won't run for a second term. So Biden's running mate will be the most consequential VP pick in American history, and soon we'll know who it is. Apparently the announcement is coming in the next week. As of tonight, Senator Kamala Harris of California seems like the frontrunner. She's certainly the best known. Harris is a product of the same highly credentialed yet deeply unimpressive world that spawned much of our media. Needless to say, they love her. She's one of them. The public, though, has been much less impressed, including Democrats. Harris was so unpopular with Democratic primary voters that she never made it to the first vote in the primary. When she dropped out in December, Harris was polling at around 3%. The rap on Harris in exit polls is that she's a fraud. She doesn't really believe in anything. She'll say whatever it takes. Of course, that is also Harris's primary strength. Here she is promising free health care to illegal aliens. So you support giving universal health care, Medicare for all, to people who are in this country illegally? Let me just be very clear about this. I am opposed to any policy that would deny in our country any human being from access to public safety, public education, or public health, period. Oh, now wait a second, you may be wondering. I'm sitting in my house, maybe unemployed, paying a huge percentage of my net worth for health care. So why should people who aren't even allowed to be in this country in the first place get it for free at my expense? And by the way, how can a government that's already $27 trillion in debt afford to pay for the rest of the world's medical bills? Now, those are all good questions. Kamala Harris has no answers. Fixing problems is not the point of the exercise. Winning is the point. And over the years, Harris has been willing to do pretty much whatever it takes to win, including use the power of her office to crush political opponents. As the Attorney General of California, Harris relentlessly defended her big donors in the abortion industry. 
When a journalist called David Daleiden criticized Planned Parenthood in a documentary, Kamala Harris sent the police to his home. Daleiden later described the authoritarian nightmare Harris unleashed on his life. They got a highly political search warrant to conduct a political raid on my home to seize the unreleased undercover footage. By the way, it's black letter California law that you are not supposed to get a search warrant to seize the unpublished materials of a journalist, whether citizen journalist, professional journalist. But that's what Kamala Harris went ahead and did at the behest of Planned Parenthood in order to cover up for them and in order to protect them from increased further scrutiny for the crimes of selling aborted baby body parts, sometimes from criminal partial birth abortions. So I think we can conclude from this episode that Kamala Harris or any politician willing to use law enforcement to stop journalism she doesn't like probably doesn't care too much about civil liberties or equality under the law. And indeed she doesn't. Harris supports allowing universities and employers to discriminate based on the skin color of applicants. What decade is this? She supports race-based reparations. She'd like to rewrite the Constitution to eliminate the Electoral College because it's inconvenient. To give you some perspective on these positions, just 10 years ago, Barack Obama would have run away from them. That's how much the Democratic Party has changed. And if you're looking at more evidence of that change, you should also know that Joe Biden is considering Congresswoman Karen Bass of Los Angeles as his running mate. She's also on the short list. Unlike Kamala Harris, Karen Bass is not a fraud. Karen Bass means it. She's sincere. She's an unapologetic left-wing bomb thrower who spent decades working to help Fidel Castro in his Cold War against the United States. Karen Bass kept praising Fidel Castro all the way to his death just four years ago. In the 1970s, Karen Bass belonged to a group that the L.A. Police Department accused of training revolutionaries in, quote, terrorist tactics and guerrilla warfare. Bass apparently visited Cuba multiple times a year. So it's not pejorative to note that Karen Bass is not a mainstream figure. She literally co-sponsored the New Way Forward Act. That is a lunatic bill that would force the U.S. government to re-import, at taxpayer expense, hundreds of thousands of illegal aliens whom we've deported for committing crimes. Bring them back here. In many cases, violent crimes. For real. Karen Bass is so extreme that, like Kamala Harris, by the way, She's currently trying to repeal California's main anti-discrimination law. Bass wants to make racial discrimination legal as it was before the civil rights movement. We're not overstating this. Karen Bass has issued press releases bragging about it. You may not have heard about any of this. The details are so shocking that virtually no media outlet bothers to cover them. But it is all real. Look it up before it's scrubbed. Keep in mind, this is the person. These are the people who could soon be running our country. Article 1 is adopted. The, que the question is on adoption of Article 2. The question is on the adoption of Article 2. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed nay. Aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. As Speaker of the House, I solemnly and sadly open the debate on the impeachment of the President of the United States. If we do not act now, we would be derelict in our duty. It is tragic that the President's reckless actions make impeachment necessary. He gave us no choice. Sadly, the American people have witnessed further wrongs of the President, which necessitate the second article of impeachment, obstruction of Congress. When the President's wrongdoing was revealed, he launched an unprecedented, indiscriminate, and categorical campaign of defiance and obstruction. Never before in the history of our nation have we seen a president declare and act as, act as he is above the law. The president goes even so far as to say and act on this absurdity when he says, Article 2 says I can do whatever I want. No, it doesn't. This is a president who doesn't want to wear a mask, who again called uh, the virus a hoax. Oh, the virus a hoax. It's going to go away magically. It's going to be a miracle that's going to make it go away. I'm a devout Catholic. I believe in miracles and I pray for them. 
but I think that science is an answer to our prayers too. And science says, wear a mask, test, trace, treat, keep your distance. The president doesn't support any of that. He has events uh, that are counter to that. So we have a, we have a moment. I'm in, a, I'm in a mood because this is a matter of life and death. And, and this um, administration has failed miserably. So it is unfathomable, unfathomable as we gather here late at night last night in the midst of a pandemic, the White House, the administration in the dark of night filed their brief in the Supreme Court to overturn the Affordable Care Act, saying to the American people, 150 million families, if you have a pre-existing condition, you will no longer have the benefit of access to quality care. The president is saying, slow down the testing. Others said he was joking. He doesn't say that. And by the way, this is not a laughing matter. It's a matter of life and death. God willing, the courts will do the right thing, but we just don't know. So we are getting prepared for what comes next in all of this. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Today we've come together in our caucus to talk about building the infrastructure of America. Uh, this is uh, so necessary for our country, and we will have our presentation to you momentarily. But first, I just want to say uh, that in about an hour or so, the President of the United States will be signing the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement. Uh, I want to say that the bill, the, what the President will be signing is quite different from what the President sent us. And because of the work of the House Democrats under the leadership of Richie Neal with his task force and made tremendous differences in what was proposed originally and what the uh, President will be signing today. I hope he understands what he's signing today. And it's about uh, with the differences in enforcement, about pr uh, protecting American workers, protecting the environment, and the prescription drug piece of that. You have this. I'm not going to even read it or reference it I, well, more than I already have. But to say uh, that because of the work of our uh, chairman of our Ways and Means Committee and the work of organized labor, the AFL-CIO and Richard Trumpka, we were able to make vast improvements. If we weren't, we would not have been able to pass the bill. We would not even want it to pass the bill. But it passed with overwhelming support. And we would uh, we wanted to do that for America's workers, America's farmers, America's economy. Uh, just because he would be the person signing it would not be a reason why we would not do something good for the American people. The yield to the distinguished chairman. Thanks, Madam Speaker. The only reason that the president is having this signing today is because of what we did as House Democrats. Just a reminder, you wrote about this for months. Rob Portman said this final agreement would have been something Barack Obama would have negotiated. Senator Toomey complained that it was too democratic and it had too many protections in there for labor rights. John Thune said this was too democratic. And today they're having a ceremony that if this original piece had been offered up to us that the president submitted, it would never have made its way out of the Ways and Means Committee. And recall that because it's a tax issue and a tariff issue, it originates in the Ways and Means Committee and in the House of Representatives. But we went to work on it with the task force that the speaker and I assembled. We engaged in intense, sometimes fiery negotiations with the U.S. trade rep. And here's what we achieved. By any objective standard, stronger provisions for workers, sounder funding mechanisms to implement the labor and environmental positions, and a better enforcement mechanism than any trade deal in American history, and this is the largest one to date. And on top of all of that, we preserve Congress's right in terms of freedom to bring down drug pricing. If anybody said that at the beginning that we could get the AFL CIO and the Teamsters to endorse this trade agreement, you would have all been very dubious. Instead, they did because of what we were able to build in to the agreement. Anyone who thinks that the president's proposal as originally submitted would have gotten out of the Ways and Means Committee, that's nonsense. It's possible that what they're signing today, I'm not even sure that some of them might even comprehend what they're signing. That's how far reaching this is. But in the fact, in the end, it was our priorities that made this happen. 193 Democrats in the House voted for the trade agreement. 
192 Republicans voted for it. In the United States Senate, 90 members of the Senate voted for the trade agreement. My point is that they voted for it for one reason. It's because of how we shaped and altered the president's proposal that came up originally before the Ways and Means Committee and the task force had a chance to alter it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Please invite the, somebody calling in the others. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you very much. Almost every American family knows the pain when a loved one is diagnosed with a serious illness. Here tonight is a special man, beloved by me. We are here to honor George Floyd. We are gathered here in Emancipation Hall, aptly named for those who built the Capitol, sadly. Last summer, a number of us, under the leadership of Karen Bass, went to Ghana to observe the 400th anniversary of the first slaves coming across the Atlantic. That tragedy, that tragedy, that horror of history, and then slavery in our own country and then all of the consequences of that. We are here to observe that pain. We are here to respect the actions of the American people to speak out against that, specifically manifested in police brutality. We are here to honor George Floyd. In a moment, we will have, we are here to observe that pain. We are here to respect the actions of the American people to speak out against that specifically manifested in police brutality. We are here to honor George Floyd. too busy or too lazy to make this kind of quick video response but today something happened and I thought it's actually important enough that I get in front of my camera and make a short video to explain something short enough for uh, for me to post on Twitter I was just looking online today like most of you and what did I see a bunch of Democrat politicians 
kneeling down, of which I have nothing to say about that because I am not an American. However, they were all ha uh, having around their necks this colorful fabric, which I'm sure they put around their necks as some kind of uh, mark or show of unity or solidarity with black people so in other words they are putting for what they can tell material or this colorful fabric they had around their necks as a, some kind of placating sign or symbol to show that they are not racist and they are together with black people excuse me dear democrats in your tokenism you didn't wait to find out that this thing that you're hanging around your neck is not just some african uniform it's actually the kente material. The kente belongs to the Ghanaian people, mainly the Ashanti tribe. Excuse me, Democrats. Don't treat Africans like we're children. These fabrics and these, you know, colorful things that we have within our culture and tradition, they all mean something to us. I know you look at us and you say, oh, Africans, you're so cute in all your colorful dresses. Well, some of those dresses and patterns and, and colors and fabrics actually do mean something to us. Some of them belong to ancient tribes and mean something to them. So why are you using it as your own show of uh, non-racism or your own show of virtue why are you using the kente material to signal your virtue stop it we are not children africans are not children and leave our tradition and our culture to us and if you don't know much about it ask somebody i'm sure there would have been something else you could have done to show your your solidarity with black people instead of taking the kente material and making a little show of it for those who wish to we will now kneel for our moment of silence